sin for the deed remit is known. Best is that we for deed dispone after our deed that live may we. Timor Martis, come to about me. Lament for a Macca, the classic mystery story by Michael Innes, dramatized for radio by Kathleen Jamie, with John Shedden as Aljo Wedderburn. Lament for a Macca. I must begin my record of the curious events at Castle Erchany with a confession. From the very beginning I had the gravest doubts, doubts which I cannot say subsequent events resolved, as to whether the right sort of person had been dispatched. <clears throat> Writers to the signet in Edinburgh, like myself, are for the most part happily associated with the quieter, the more spacious, the truly learned aspects of the law. The pleasure of conveyancing, together with discreet superintendence of bankruptcies, alimonies, and insanities among the best Scottish families. We've been reluctant to engage ourselves in the lurid limelight of the criminal law. Mr. Bell was later to tell me that those events which befell at Castle Erkenny were but the plain work of the devil from start to finish. Oh, it's not for me to say whether Ranald Guthrie was in league with the devil, or indeed that Lucifer himself was enthroned at Castle Erkenny, whatever the good folk of Kincaid village muttered amongst themselves. That muttering grew loud when Isa Murdoch, the little maid at Erkenny, packed her trunk one night and fled. Sinny is all my brother, Tain. He will not let me live alone. On force a man his next prey be. Timor Mortis, come to that me. Eyes are murder. What's that? Oh, they're drowned. Mr. Guthrie's the never here. Open the house. Can Mr. Walter Kennedy, who point of death lies there, can he truth it where this must be? How long since these were open, Mrs. Harker? Ah, and it would be about fifty years since the old last time Arthur Spider's not an awful bother to you, eyes a mother. Oh, it's just oh. me, creatures. Not like that. Not like the rat. Oh, it's a picture they're all decayed, the curtains. They've been so lovely once. I've never seen these rooms. I've never seen just cobwebs. Mm -hmm. I don't like cobwebs, Miss Christine. Give me the broom, I'll help. Do you know what the rat is about? Is it going to hold with the gentry after all these years? Or will there be balls and musical evenings and these great boxes sent from Edinburgh? I don't know. Andy's wanting lunch in the great chamber today and the gallery opened. Have you been in there yourself, Miss Christine? Uh, the gallery? No, I've never been there. Uncle closed up most of the house when he came home. Ah, Christine. I had a notion to lunch in here today. If you will, Uncle. I feel it's very dusty. I've given instruction for that to be dealt with and the lumber to be removed. Uh, but not this table. Flemish, I believe. Very fine. Oh, do take your place. I will ring. Yes? At the end there. Two more boxes arrived today from Edinburgh, Uncle. One was booked. Good. Have Hardcastle will bring them to the tower. And the other? Provisions, Uncle. Fountains of fruit, chutney. Ah, I, the Murdoch. What have you brought us? A bit stewed rabbit layered and a jug of milk. Then at least serve it on a silver dish, if you will. There will be one somewhere. And we will have a bottle from the cellar. The cellar, Mr. Guthrie? Uncle would like some wine, I, sir. What are you gawking at, girl? Is the gallery opened? N no, Mr. Guthrie. 
Okay, to lose it where that so should be. Tabar Martis, come to back me. I'll get you your wine, Uncle. What? No, my dear. A glass of milk. Have you got a key, Miss Christie? No. Uncle said nothing about a key. Perhaps it's just a boat. He said the door was behind a curtain. Here it's here. You must have been in a high passion that day, Miss Christie. Well, you know, my uncle would never employ a locksmith if he could board it up himself. But he must have been in a fury indeed. Don't catch a of flowers, the noble It's friend. coming. Marcus flower, the monk and berry and gower all the free. Uncle, at the door of the gallery. Is it open? It's boarded. The nail of the trevenant is so deep. Thomas! Oh. Tell us! Bring my axe and see it fell clean! Yes, yes, I know how the nails are. Did I not do it myself? I suppose I will have to undo it myself. If I'm to have it open, I must have it open. No, thank you, Thomas. Stand back. It's your luck. I believe you've never seen the gallery. A most interesting collection of family portraits. I must change my clothes before dinner. The hard castle will clear the debris here. Do look around at your letter. Aye. Aeneas was undoubtedly the right man for the job. When Mrs. McRattle of Dunk poisoned her head keeper by injecting sheep dip into a haggis with a hypodermic syringe... It was by Aeneas the matter was adjusted. Aeneas was just the man for Ercole. However, such were the events of the day before Isa Murdoch left the Muckle House. It was, though, the events of the night which went clean over the head of the girl. The pussy, oh, the pussy. Thomas! You shouldn't have said this Thomas, before. Thomas, away with you. Sure. Oh, no. No, you don't. Oh. 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 oh, I'll break my neck. If I get through this night, I'll never spend another under this roof. And by the great God, he will. <sighs> what for would it not what, man? Eh? What for would it not what? <laughs> yes, Aeneas was just the man for Erchene, and was indeed dispatched, only to break a leg hastily changing trains of path. I need not detail the alternative arrangements I endeavoured to make. They failed. On the afternoon of Boxing Day, I set out for Dunwinnie myself. My annoyance was increased by the discovery that I was to have Clan Clackett as a travelling companion. Clan Clackett is a chilly bore. We were on the fourth bridge before he spoke. Well, Weatherburn, you're going north. It's a holiday you're taking, Weatherburn. A professional journey. Notice, Clan Clackett, that the fleet is in... Uh, what's your station? I change at Perth. Uh, may I offer you Blackwoods? Oh, yes, Blackwood. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Uh, you were saying, Weatherburn, that uh, you change at Perth for... Uh, Darwinie. Oh, your business is there. My business, my dear Clan Clackett, is there or thereabouts. The Frasers of Merdy? No. The Grants of Kildoon? No. The Guthrie's of Erkening. I am acquainted with none of them. For over an hour we pursued the eccentricities of the Frasers of Mervy. On these matters, Clan Clackett is notoriously encyclopedic. My knowledge of Guthrie was confined to that gleaned from the morning Scotsman. I ventured to ask, simulating a yawn, the Guthrie's of Erkening, their interesting folk. And for forty minutes I was to learn exactly how picturesque by which time we were with them still on the far side of the 18th century. Mercifully, we were to arrive at Ranald before we arrived at Perth. Uh, take Ranald, Guthrie. 
the present laird. Once more the same morbid constitution. I believe he's artistically inclined. Dear me. Sent abroad, Australia. Three or four times as far away as Canada. Considerable advantage. Ranald didn't like it. On first seeing Fremantle Harbour, he endeavoured to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Saved by the bravery of his elder brother, Ian. Of course, he came home when he inherited. Ian had died? Yes, there was some tragedy. Ronald, an unstable person, as I say, was upset. Greatly upset. When he came home, he lived in a very peculiar manner. I understand that he still does, and that he is, in fact, a miser and a recluse. It was. I beg your pardon, Weatherman? Ranald Guthrie has just died. He is pierced. I'm afraid I must hurry. Uh, pray, Clank, I could keep Blackwood. Uh, goodbye. I succeeded in reaching Kincaid just short of nine o'clock. It is the merest hamlet, and I counted myself fortunate in securing simple but adequate accommodation at an inn laconically known as the Arms. Precise information would remain unavailable until the following morning. Meanwhile, I did not think it wise altogether to neglect the voice of rumour. Ah, Mrs. Robertson, mm. would you be so good as to bring me a... What you'll be in need of is a nice cup of malted milk. Yes, it is exactly what I was going to ask for. A oh. nice cup of malted milk, if you please. It is proper to testify that the potation with which she returned was not unpotable. Moreover, she was inclined to be talkative. Mr. Guthrie's death was actual enough, but in listening to Mrs. Roberts, I was listening to the voice of rumour to the lingering, myth-making faculty of simple folk. Revenge, murder, mutilations, and a ghost. And must I confess to an unwanted quickening of the pulse of the senior partner of Wedderburn, Wedderburn, and McTodd? Mrs. Roberts, have many folks seen the ghost? Yes, yes. You yourself? Yes, no. Then who? Well... The first would be Mistress McLaren. The pump in her yard was frozen fast, and she was going down the road for water when she saw the uncouthy thing right afore her in the moonlight. Oh, she gave a stretch, poor creature that was fed by half and Kegan. And you wouldn't have better proof than that. No, doubtless. Like this it was. Oh! Yes, no, 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 indeed. And uh, this Mistress McLaren, yes. does she often see ghosts? Oh, fancy you asking that, sir. A Highland bird. Is she is and second sighted. It was her that foresaw the dafty Thomas come loping through the snow with news of Guthrie's death. And it was her that knew Guthrie had the evil eye. Excuse me, Mr. Wedderburn, sir. I wonder if you would see a caller. You and Bell, it is. He apologizes for the late hour. I can hardly refuse, Mr. Roberts. And you'll be wanting a toddy, I'm thinking, in this dreek weather. Mr. Wedderburn, you take another malted milk. Uh, yes. Yeah. Mr. Bell will forgive me if I describe him as venerable and magnificent. His shoulders might have been that of a smith rather than of a cobbler. He bowed to me gravely. Mr. Wedderburn, I, I am given to understand you are to represent the family interest in the probing of the sad affair at the Mucklefoots. I am giving advice to the young American lady, yes. Now, you'll have heard some queer-like talk, I've no doubt. But I have a thought that if there's any talk of it being other than an accident that's befallen at Erchene, I will say this. The departure of Miss Mathers and the lad Lindsay was at the bidding of the laird. That is, if I'm not starting in medias res. Mr. Bell, you interest me. Uh, may I invite you to take something against this very dreech weather? Uh, just against the weather, Mr. Weatherburn. Uh, Mr. Guthrie was not well liked. Well, uh, uh, when word got round Kincaid that Guthrie had done himself a fatal mischief, there were a few that were sorry, and many that were right glad. Of all the dwellers in the glens hereabouts, it was only of Ronald Guthrie you could honestly say he was as mean as an Englishman. <laughs> if I repaired his old shoon once, I repaired them a hundred times. He even cleared the home farm of its folk for no good reason. Feed a shepherd, and that was another bit of land gone back to the sheep. I doubt there'll soon be nothing left of the old Scotland, Mr. Wedderburn. Mm -hmm. Only a pack of Highland gillies to lick the dopes of a feckless grouse-raising gentry. 
That and a few million coarse Irish creatures starving on the Clyde. As most succinctly put, Mr. Bell. Uh, pray continue. Well, Cathy lived alone. That is, but for Christine and the two half-castles, the serpents. There was a wee maid called Isa Murdoch, which she fled his madness. Ever going about with his eye fixed on the middle ear and, and muttering names. Names? Henderson, Kennedy. Oh, most exceptional. Oh, you're not a literary man, Mr. Wedderburn, eh? Oh, well, no matter. Christine Mathers was Guthrie's niece and warden. She was brought to the castle as an infant. There's a power of evil idle talk in this parish, and I repeat it only that you might have full sight of the story. But some said she was not Guthrie's niece, but his daughter. Huh? And some that he brought her up, not out of duty, but to make a mistress of her. Dear me. Oh, there's ever tongues clicking in Kincaid. The myth-making faculty of our simple folk. I do gossip, I cried. With the daft talk of what befell the corpse, well, you'll have heard that the fingers were choked from its right hand. The hanging of Neil Lindsay... He's on the lips of every corpus and buck-faced old buddy in the parish. You maybe think Aristotle has some potion from the dispensary, but the story of the old feud between the Guthrie's and the Lynch's is told to the babes in arms. Well, I'm very much afraid, Mr. Bell, that despite professional involvement with many of the old Scottish families, this nugget of history has yet to reach my ears. The hour is late. Let it be enough to say that before the Reformation, there was a Lindsay lay with the wife of a Guthrie. And the Guthrie found out, and hacked the lecherous fingers from him before he sent him home to die. Ah. And that was the beginning of the feud betwixt the Guthries and the Lindsays. And the beginning of this sorry chapter would be about the 11th of November. A great snow fell on arms this morn, and after, a hurricane fit to bring down another tay bridge and rip great sheets of lead from the crazy battlements of Castle Erkany. More snow, a bit drift, and the place was snowed up entirely. It's a wonder the maid eyes of mud that got through that night. After her, it was Miss Strachan was the last of the village to see Guthrie alive, before the dafty Thomas brought the news down the glen. Who is the schoolmistress? Ah, aye, joins a sharp eye to a long nose. No doubt it was the inquisitiveness of her that took her the long way round to visit her auntie in Kildoon. Oh, or maybe it's her being near straight on the athletic ideal, the lure of the wanderer as she'd have it herself. It's enough that the last weekend of November, up the glen to Erkney, she went. So when the full blast of the storm came down, she held on past her usual track and was presently dropping down to the empty biggins of Erkney Farm. Aye, and seeing Christine. Oh, oh, praise be. There's Christine. Oh, there's a way back to me, aren't you? Christine! Oh, Christine! There's manners. It's an awful way back to me, aren't oh, oh, dear, she's gone. There's a giant sleepwalking. Christine, are you not going home this way back? Oh, oh, I can't see that. Nakedness and kinky gossip, Mr. Wedderburn. Not if you're seeking to make her yours. I want to marry her, Guthrie. Oh. Can't be. 
She wants to marry me. <laughs> We're marrying Guthrie. And it's not you can stop her. See? That I can, Neil Lindsay. For how? Kristen's underage in the boat. That will mend. And there's another question. <laughs> Indeed? What is Christine to you? Off you Say that again. Married yes. or unmarried, I say. And if it's not too late, yes. she'll never be burned by you. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, oh, forgive me. You just might be my grandfather. I'm sorry, Guthrie. Not all bad blood that has been cleaned out. Oh. You'll pay. Oh. What? Oh. Madam, oh, oh. am I to stand in some distress? That was the last anyone but myself heard of Ronald Guthrie before the tragedy. It was the night of 28th November Miss Starkin spent at the Mucklehoose. It was on the 10th December, just before the great snows all but closed the glens entirely, that Christine Mathers came to me with her story. Came to you, Mr. Bell? Oh, she and I have been long acquainted. The first nurse that Guthrie ever got for her was my own sister's child. Uncle Ewan, I was to her. A secret queen. She grew to be. But fine I knew what had befallen the last long ere the schoolmistress brought the unlucky name of the lad to Kincaid, Mr. Wedderburn. We chance to remember what young people are. Wedded to him and bedded to him she would be. And the two of them would away to Canada, where he had a cousin would set him in the way of the work he wanted. But Guthrie was dead set against it. Absolute with a rage of passion burning in him. No more was Neil easy. He was right passionate against Guthrie in his turn, and was all for storming Erkene like young Rock and Bar and marrying Christine in secret. But Christine's instinct was against it. She felt Guthrie had some power over her she could break only by fighting him in the open. When I asked her, perhaps, in foolish enough words, and you really want to marry him, she looked at me almost mockingly for a moment and just said, I'm driven. Have you seen my uncle lately? I haven't seen him in here this year past. But you'll have heard talk. Well, I haven't lost my hearing yet, Christine. Yes, there's always talk in Kincaid, I'm sure. But have you heard that he's gone mad? Oh, don't fast yourself over that. They were saying no less of him before you were born. It's what they would say of any lair that didn't talk grouse and oats and pretend to be cut greedy on a Sunday. But he's mad. There are provisions as if we were going to be besieged at Erkenny. And he's bought a big crate of books. Well, surely the lair has ever been a great reader. Yes, but he doesn't buy books. And these are something he's never paid heed to before. Medical books. Up there in the tower, he's poring over them night after night. Oh, Christine, would they be books about the mind? No, the ones I've seen aren't. Why did Isa Murdoch leave us? She was easy frightened. Have you chanced to hear your uncle holding in with any folk called Walter Kennedy and Robert Henderson? <laughs> <laughs> in Dunfermline, he has Tim Brun with Mr. Robert Henderson. Sir John the Ross and Brast has he. Timur Mortis conturbat me. Quoth the Dunbar when he was sick, and quoth my uncle in his gallery, also sick maybe. So, Mr. Wedderburn, you will perceive there was more to Guthrie's conduct than could be accounted for by the love between Christine and Neil. Uh. Oh dear. It's late now, Mr. Wedderburn, and I've all but finished. Uh, we drop more, Mr. Bell. Uh, no, no, no that, that's enough. And, uh, tell you, if I may, the queer end of this part of the tale. Well, Mr. Bell, your company is most congenial, and the interest of your tale increases with the hour. Well, then came the snow, and Kincaid was cut off from the world, and Erkany from Kincaid again. All except for Thomas, who got through with a letter. Uncle Ewan Bell, I was a little fool with my fancies. Will you forgive me? It's all right. I'm sure it's all right. And I only have to wait till Christmas Day. Uncle Ronald came in this morning. He seemed in a rare, pleased mood. Suddenly he said softly, Must you have him, Christine? I just said yes. No more. He said you shall go with him. 
and many spoke harshly of the disgrace, and that we must go if we did go once and forever, that there was money for me that I should have, and that Neil should come for me at Christmas, and that we might away to Canada. But he said he would have no wedding, or word of a wedding in these parts, and that I needn't repeat words I want, and shall soon have the chance to forget. But I won't forget you, Uncle Ewan. Oh, I'm so happy, and yet afraid. I'm free, I almost think. Goodbye, and love, dear Ewan Bell. I shall be safe with Neil, and he with me. It was right anxiously I spent the next three days, Mr. Wedderburn. It was when the few folk in Kincaid that will admit Christmas a feast of the kirk were at service that Thomas came again. Ah, 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 The world of the three steeds and martyrs. I was awakened in the morning by a clamour proceeding from the assembled young of Kincaid. It was occasioned by the appearance at the tail of the village of a tall and slender youth bearing on his shoulder the prime cause, this, of the juvenile excitement, implements which I presently identified as ski sticks and ski. It was to be conjectured that here was a visitor from Erkene. I dressed and hurried downstairs. Ah, I'm no Gilby. I think you must be the gentleman who's been good enough to come and help us. And my name, I said, is Wedderburn, and I have come to give what help I can. Oh, then, sir, begin by offering me breakfast. No, my first mistake was to stop in the village. Now, you know how it is. I got out the map and saw it would be so much quicker such a way. <laughs> Alas, I did about ten miles on trains and I didn't like it a bit. So, I stopped in the village to inquire. You puppy. Hello? I say, would you be so good as to show me the road south? South, mister? Yes, London. London, is it? There, yonder's it. So, yonder yours truly went, slithering and plunging through two feet of snow. A mile on, I picked up a tail light. Home by Christmas. <laughs> Oh. Well, that's just sweet of you, stranger. I'm so sorry. Like a fool. I was following your lights. What happened? I guess I came off the road. Are you hurt? Really offended. Warm your hands, why don't you, on the radiator? Well. There was a pub back in that village, Kincaid. Maybe we could get back to that. Uh, I... I think we'll make for the house straight ahead. You have a suitcase? In the wreckage. <sighs> Geronimo, it is time for thee to trudge. A pleasantly literary lady, Sybil. What ensued was a sort of pocket edition of the worst journey in the world. It was dank, cold, and there was, of course, snow. Sometimes we fell into it in all sorts of diverting ways, like people in the Christmas edition of Punch. Mm. Kyle Rowland to the dark tower came. The light's gone out. No, look, it's coming down. See? A spiral staircase. Oh. Come on. Oh, moat. Give me the torch. There, drawbridge. <laughs> Would you mind very much sleeping in the haunted room? I'm not superstitious, Mr. Gilby. Come on. We are two people that have had a motor accident. Are we? we? Uh, oh, well, thank you. Oh, a charming chap. That's enough, our coffee. Please come in. Welcome to Erkene. My name is Guthrie. How strange. My name is Guthrie, too. Mr. Wedderburn, I received the immediate impression that this Mr. Guthrie was mad. Mad, Mr. Gilby? Mad, Mr. Wedderburn. I had the oddest feeling as he looked at us that he was really plotting us on an invisible graph or giving us our places on an invisible board. Hmm. We must find you rooms and a fire. 
Not homely. Certainly not. Do you suppose he ever feeds the dog? <laughs> and who is that? Hardcastle, have your wife light fires in these rooms? I lived. Miss Guthrie, your room and yours, Mr. Gilby, on the left. We will meet for supper at nine. Mr. Gilby, Miss Guthrie, my niece, Miss Christine Mathers. How do you do? I'm sorry to hear of your misfortune. I hope you will be comfortable with us until the thaw. Comfortable? Please, sit down. Mrs. Hardcastle, some caviar, Miss Guthrie. Perhaps you're not partial to caviar. Mr. Gilby. Yes, it was what North Britons appear to call a scummer. We were to find comfort amongst signs of either the most improbable poverty or a pathological parsimony. The dogs, Mr. Wedderburn, were starving. The table was ill-lit by one tallow candle, and we were served caviar on a silver plate. And have you friends nearby, Mr. Gilby, who would know that you had taken the Erkany Road? None, I'm afraid. A pity. And your car is badly damaged. Mm -hmm. Yours too, Miss Guthrie? It was rather too dark to tell, I'm afraid. Of course. By the time Christine had taken Sybil out of the hall, I was next to hypnotized by that clock. Had it suddenly gesticulated with both its hands and cried out, Sleep no more, Macbeth doth murder sleep, I wouldn't have been surprised. Mr. Gilby, the snow may detain you some time, and you must excuse our simple way of living. Uh, Miss Mathers is being put to the most awful trouble. Miss Guthrie and I are terribly grateful. Mr. Gilby, I am glad you found your way here. Hardcastle! Hardcastle, if the lad Lindsay comes, though I don't think he can get up in the snow, you must let him in. I'll see him once again. If you believe me, Laird, the lad's black, dangerous. What's that, man? I say, Neil, Lindsay means mischief. Lindsay can come up to the tower. Uh, Mr. Gilby, the lady... And then we set off down a long corridor. Tamar. Mr. Guthrie? Tamar Mortis, come to about me. I'm sorry? Sir Gilbert, he ended as he. Tamar Mortis, come to about me. And I swear the fear of death was stark on him, Mr. Wedderburn. Then the rhythm of his murmuring changed, and he cried out, Oh, my America! My newfound land. Yes, a singular gentleman, Mr. Guthrie. Oh, I'll say. But it struck me then, I found the reason for the indescribable Hardcastle's calling out about the doctor. The laird was having a bout of his mild madness, and the household was waiting to smuggle in a leech. Mm. Would you mind terribly if I rang for more toast? Oh, no. Breakfast at Erkany were rather a joyless affair. Now, the next morning, Christmas Eve... And were the rats an awful bother to you, sir, in the night? Yeah. There's an awful rats about Erkene. Indeed, there are. Good morning, Noel. You slept well? To tell the truth... It's the rats. Quiet. Mrs. Hardcastle, do you have many visitors? Ah, the layers are narrow. There are few in these parts nearer going than Guthrie of Erkene. It's the rats. The rats. Mrs. Hardcastle? The gutters of I had block imaginings. He thinks the rats are fear eating him up, him and all his substance. And he won't even spend the cellar on the poison for them. He says he prefers his wee pen knife. He spears the rat? Aye, and wrecked loud the creature squeal. But no, it's a hatchet. Sharpening and sharpening it yesterday he was. And he cried out to me, wrecked fearsome, to settle accounts with a great rat, Mrs. Hardcastle. I wish he'd settle accounts with them all. I wish there were no rats. <clears throat> Couldn't Mr. Hardcastle... Ah, oh, my man's fell unkind. It's the rat nature working on him. More and more, my man's like a great grey rat. And what'll become of us when I cannot any longer tell man for rat?
You'll agree, Mr. Wedderburn, that Mrs. Hardcastle has the knack of posing awkward questions. She has plainly a touch of genius as an imaginative psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> After breakfast, Christine took us to a sort of gallery place full of dead Guthrie's. After luncheon, she bowed us into a billiards room with the very table I swear that Noah played to while the tedious hour. And so we seemed doomed. I choose my words with care. Spending Christmas Eve at Castle Erkeny. Well, if you'll excuse me, I'll retire now. Uncle Bennett's tower. So please ring for Mrs. Hartcastle if there's anything at all that you need. Thank you, Miss Majors. Good night. Good night. <sighs> no. I'm cold to the bone. I'm going to read in bed. Good night. Yes, I shall to bed too very shortly. I have in my head a plan for a rat-proof tent. Right, you blighters. Know thy enemy. Let's see how you like a poker. Missed. Bold and bolder, aren't they? Well, let's... Good Lord. Mr. Wedderburn, I had seen big rats and small... Brown, black, and piebald. Let me tell you that the appearance of a pink or blue variety could not have occasioned in me more surprise than what I now beheld. I was looking at a learned rat. A learned rat, Mr. Gilbert? Hmm. And there were more. Rats, that is. Lugging about with them little paper scrolls. Rather like students who've just been given a neatly printed degree. I saw two or three. <laughs> come out, come out, wherever you are. Right. Ah. Oh. It was a learned one. There's luck. Let's have a look. Oh. Ring help secretly to Tower Top Urgent. Oh, my giddy aunt. I dressed. It didn't occur to me that the thing was melodramatic or absurd or a fantasy of Guthrie's. Twenty-four hours spent at Erkenny had conditioned me to taking the appeal of the learned rat in my stride. I simply wondered how best to make the top of the tower. At that, I remembered Sybil Guthrie's electric torch. Sybil! Sybil! It's no! I'm coming in! Sybil! Where are you? Suspicion became certainty. There was no one in the room. But at that, a candle flickered in the corridor. I emerged expecting Sybil. Mr. Hardcastle, um, I... I assure you, uh, Mr. Hardcastle, oh, yes. I... compliments to you, sir. Says, would you join him for a nightcap in the tower? Yes. As it happens, I was just going there myself. It wanted five minutes of midnight... The very eve of Christmas. What's that? Rats, just... Who's that? Rats, I tell you. Come on. Who's a turd to climb yet? Mind the stairs. <sighs> oh. Nearly there. It was then, Mr. Wedderburn. Oh, God, if I didn't warn them... Lindsay! Out of my way! Slinking wee rat! Come back! Never mind him, new Mr. Gilby. Come on, man. Right. Up! Oh. Come on! Sybil! You'll be you, Lamar. Shut up, Hardcastle. Sybil, where is Guthrie? He has fallen from the tower. Now, there are only two rooms at the top of the tower, Mr. Wedderburn. Guthrie's study and what I took to be his bedroom. Both have small doors onto the parapet, which completely islands the top of the tower. Yes. Uh, the first thing I did was to let myself out into the wind and darkness. It was my impression that there had been a good deal of coming and going on that parapet, almost a commotion. Uh, and the snow was disturbed in, in such a way that it was, it was clear that the trapdoor had been recently opened. The trapdoor, Mr. Gilbert? Uh, oh, forgive me. Uh, the tower is reached by two staircases. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, the one which I had followed with Hardcastle, which opens into Guthrie's study, 
The other, which is quite separate, a tiny spiral that winds from the bottom of the tower and comes out through a trap door directly onto the parapet. Yes, yes. Uh, this, as I say, had been open, but was now bolted from below. Another thing was clear to me. Unless he was drunk or really demented, Ranald Guthrie couldn't have taken that drop by accident. It falls sheer to the moat far beneath, and even with the depth of snow, no one could have survived that fall. Sybil, I think you should wait here. I'm coming with you. Take my torch. Oh, very well. Oh, Lord, look at Hardcastle. And what will become of us when we can't any longer tell man from rat? <laughs> Mr. Hardcastle, do wait. We have a torch. You can see the lamp still burning in his yes. study. Look up. I'd much rather not. He fell from the parapet outside his little bedroom, which puts it farther round. Noel, shine the torch, please. There. Mr. Wedderburn, a man can cry out in agony and fear, fall 200 feet through the air, break his neck, and look at the end of it like a babe asleep in the cradle. A trick of the muscles at the ultimate moment, no doubt. But Guthrie and his dust had returned to innocence. As if some artist had taken a sponge and wiped the baser lines of that sinister face clean away. I composed the body as best I could and waited till Hardcastle brought a sheet. Between us then, and with some difficulty, for Guthrie had been a strong and powerful man, we got him into the cellar and onto a trestle table. Ah. Mr. Gilby, you have had a look at the body. It might have been robbed of a light. The police will inquire into that. Oh, but sorry, we might just give a bit look and see. Mr. Hardcastle. That's murder. That remains to be seen, Mr. Hardcastle. I tell you, the Tinkloon lives in mischief and murder them. And now he's a war with the lassie. Come upstairs. Oh, the a good lamp, deed, and all that is a war. Well, let's see. What's that, devil? Everyone, please. Will everyone please be quiet? And Miss Guthrie, Sybil, where is Miss Mavis? Gone. Thomas, do you think you could get down to Kintec? Mr. Hardcastle, can you make Thomas understand he must get to Kincaid if he can and fetch the police? He can. Oh, Sybil, come with me. The scene of the crime. But no, there was no crime. I told you, he simply fell. How did he manage that? He simply fell. Do you insist on something more lurid? There will be a tremendous number of questions asked, you know. Where everyone was and why. And I should practice my reply. I should you. like you to. I was up here spying around. Enterprising of you. This household kind of got me curious, and I just felt like hiding behind doors and listening. I got the instinct. Very well, Sybil. You have been prying and listening. Go ahead. This tower had been intriguing me. It's so romantic. Cut it out, Sybil. Okay. I saw a light moving about in the gallery about half past eleven. I couldn't sleep and thought if Guthrie was in the gallery, the tower might be open to inspection. I took my torch and climbed the tower staircase. It went better than I dared hope. I looked through the keyhole into Guthrie's study. Guthrie wasn't there, so I opened the door, just a crack, and went in. Well, now, Laird Reynolds. And then I heard footsteps on the stair. Noel, I had no place to hide, and I just couldn't stand there and face him, so I did a really dumb thing. I let myself out onto the parapet. At that moment, the wind dropped, and I could just hear... Mr. Lindsay, sit down. Thank you, Hardcastle. And I was watching from the parapet. I couldn't hear clearly. The wind got up again... And it was so cold out there, Noel. They were talking angrily? Earnestly, formally, both stood up. Lindsay shook his head and they moved towards the door. They were in view all the time? All the time. They shook hands at the door, formally. Lindsay went out and Guthrie turned. I could see his face. He looked, I don't know how to put it, 
tragic and broken. He took a key from his pocket and made for the little bedroom there. He disappeared, shut the door behind him. It seemed about a, a minute or maybe half a minute. Then I heard a cry. I stood another minute, then tried to make a dash for it. You walked in on me. Sybil, you said he has fallen from the tower. How did you know? I tell you, I knew Noel Gilby. That interview had somehow crushed the man. I saw his death on his face. He was next to Matt anyhow, and when his plans went wrong... He had failed, you mean, to buy Lindsay off. Couldn't bear the thought of losing his niece. Something like that. And it should be lurid enough for you. Well, that was a useful trial spin, Sybil. In other words, I'm lying. You are lurking here. Guthrie goes into the bedroom, there is a cry, we rush in, and your mind takes a great leap in the dark, a leap to the truth, maybe. But you see how strange it could be made to look. Only the fact that you have no real connection with Guthrie is between you and positive suspicion. Noel, shall I tell you the truth? Oh, for goodness sake, do. I am Ranald Guthrie's heir. I wasn't altogether surprised, Mr. Wedderburn. That there were wheels within wheels in Sybil Guthrie's relations with Erkin is something that I'd had a dim sense of for some time. You will see now, as I did, that I'd come upon her in the middle of a more than ingenious plan to gate-crash on Erkenny, a plan into which she incorporated me magnificently and in her stride. A resolute driving of her car over a bank I recall with positive awe. She was really plotting you on an invisible graph or giving you your place on an invisible board. Mr. Wedderburn? Your very words with reference to the late Laird of Erkney. That the two were related is becoming obvious. He tricked us, Noel. I was just a child and my father died. He tricked us out of the rightful inheritance that should have come to my mother and me through my father. So, when we heard rumor that he was mad and irresponsible, having an interest in the estate, we tried in various ways to discover the true state of affairs. Then... Finding myself in England, I thought I might drive north and see for myself. And now you're in an awful scrape, Sybil. Yes, I am, Noel. I think I'd better have a lawyer or something. Yes, I think you had. In fact, you have. I just wired. Noel, Gilby, explain yourself. <sighs> Guthrie dead, Hardcastle muttering murder, and you being found up here. We must protect ourselves, mustn't we? And I have an uncle in Edinburgh, a soldier. He has the Scottish command. You'll see the right sort of persons dispatched. Oh, say, you have a neck. No, Gilby. The point is, Sybil, so do you. And, Mr. Wedderburn, you were good enough to come. I didn't think anyone would really want to hang, Sybil. I rather hoped they'd be able to hang Hardcastle, though I couldn't see just how. Uh, yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Wedderburn... I wonder if you would see a caller. It's you and Bell, sir, who was with you last night. Oh, yes, of course. Ah, Mr. Bell. <laughs> well, now that I'm back in civilization, I shall take on supplies. I believe the post office will carry a tin of John Cotton. Uh, I'll not detain you, Mr. Wedderburn. Uh, I just wanted to show you the very letter Christine wrote. The affair is heavy with me, uh, and I wanted to know I'd made myself plain. Uh, that the young person's departure was at the bidding of the laird? Just that. And as for the laird driving them out in secret and at midnight into a storm, it's just what would fit the black humor of the man. You really think he did that? I do. And that Guthrie then committed suicide in some sort of despair? I think that's the conclusion we'll be come to, Mr. Wedderburn. Mr. Bell, I must be getting up to Erkene. You look dissatisfied. I'm very grateful to you for coming in, Mr. Bell. You're an important witness, and I shall no doubt see you at this afternoon's inquest. And you think, Mr. Wedderburn, it will be suicide proven? I think the police or others must find Lindsay and Miss Mathers. As a historical monument, Erfany is, I suppose, of quite minor importance. But my first impression of it is the car turned a bend, and I sighted the castle across a final arm of the frozen loch was of something darkly powerful and inviolably lonely. Looking at the sheer lines of the tower from a distance, I could understand Gilby's instant knowledge that the man who'd fallen from that height 
was inevitably dead. Mr. Gilby, I take it that nothing untoward was discovered about Guthrie's body? I don't understand. Well, as the story runs in Kincaid, this desperate Lindsay had chopped off a number of the fingers. Oh, I really think the scotch uh, the bloody limit. <laughs> no, 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 Guthrie's fingers are intact. Another thing. Your impression of Lindsay when he passed you on the stairs, you received an extraordinarily vivid impression of passion. Was that impression accurate? Yes, I don't think my impression was wrong. Now, about the man Hardcastle. You're something of a prejudiced witness, and you're inclined to credit him with some hidden motive in the affair? You wait till you see him. One last point. You thought Guthrie was mad. I thought him mad from the first few minutes. Only I used the word loosely. He was broken, fragmented. He was mad. As the heroes were mad when the Furies were hunting them down. Oh, a most illuminating remark, Mr. Gilby. I've always maintained against our education reformers that there is the greatest utility in the grand old fortifying classical curriculum. <laughs> Mr. Gilby, you'll not have disremembered it. Here you are, Mrs. Hardcastle. Uh, Mr. Wedderburn, Mrs. Hardcastle. Uh, uh, you best know at once there's a terrible number of rats at Erkeny. I'm fooling it no more. But don't tell my man whilst he sets them at me. The dogs, Mrs. Hardcastle? The rats. The hall's this way, Mr. Wedderburn, and the police are already here. Uh, quite an operation. Good afternoon, gentlemen. A wee bit on the chilly side. My name is Speight, Inspector Speight from Dunwinnie. You are Mr. Wedderburn? Yes, sir. Mr. Gilby, I've already met. Hmm? I don't know how much information you've already gathered. I have, I believe, some grip on the situation, Inspector. You have no doubt traced the young people who were packed off by the late Mr. Guthrie. Packed off? I don't know about that. A point that will emerge, Inspector. And where have they got to? Strangely enough, we've had no word of them yet, but then they've good reason to lie pretty low. Uh, you have grounds for believing that the young Mr. Lindsay has committed some crime. The lad pitched Guthrie to his death. I haven't a doubt of it. I think there may be some evidence in direct rebuttal. Ah, well, to be sure, there's Miss Guthrie. Yes, Miss Guthrie, who was mysteriously on the very battlement from which the dead man fell, and who is it appears the dead man's heir. <laughs> A position not without its delicacy. Ah, the American lassie didn't do it. The lassie's real nice. Uh, so you think, Inspector, that it's Lindsay or nothing? An old feud? A witness that he was in a blazing passion? Him and the girl gone? One could hardly ask for more. Unless, perhaps, the chopping of the fingers from the corpse. <laughs> you have that, eh? Never heed foolish click, Mr. Wedderburn. You and I are concerned with facts. An appreciation of the facts, the lie of the land, is essential to the presentation of a good case, Miss Guthrie. If you insist, Mr. Wedderburn... I must confess, I've had just about enough of this place after the events of the past couple of days. Uh, bear with me, Miss Guthrie... Os, the principles and practice of medicine. Muir's textbook of pathology. Mm, study here, Ranald Guthrie certainly did. More medicine. Experimental radiology by Richard Flinders. <laughs> Very strange. Where, I wonder, does the science of medicine come into the picture? Well, it comes, for that matter, into the poem here. In medicine, the most practitioners, leeches, surgianus, et physicianus, then self radid may not supply to more mortis contour about me. That's very interesting. And if I may remark, Miss Guthrie, you have considerable facility in Middle Scots. You studied it at college? Why, yes, I did. May I ask, then, if you've taken your Ph.D.? Yes, Mr. Wedderburn, I have. Then you're quite sure that you are not the doctor for whom Hardcastle was on the lookout? What an extraordinary piece of ingenuity. Of course I'm not. He knew nothing about me. And one doesn't arrange to be called doctor all one's days just because of a roaring piece of pedantry in you. Yes, I suppose not. 
Let us search further, Miss Guthrie. Noel Gilby has been so struck by what he calls your executive ability, he's missed the romanticism of your underlying motive. And then, Mr. Wedderburn, what? I'm wondering whether this romanticism has not made you manipulate a little what you witnessed in this tower? You mean that Ronald Guthrie didn't commit suicide, after all? On the contrary. I'm convinced he committed suicide. I think you liked Miss Smithers. I did. And this young Mr. Lindsay, from what you saw of him? I thought him quite beautiful, Mr. Wedderburn. What's fundamentally important is what took place between Guthrie and Lindsay. And that's where you've actually lied. You say Lindsay left quietly. Noel Gilby says he left in a blazing passion. He's right. Now, let me assure you of this. Neil Lindsay's safe. Is safe? I have a picture of the case no prosecution could break through. Guthrie committed suicide. Lindsay needs your protection no more. What he needs is your simple story of what happened in this room. Please, give it to me. I couldn't be certain Neil hadn't slipped back and through the bedroom to the battlements for the necessary half minute, but I knew he hadn't. I knew. Everything I've said about that interview was true, except right at the end. It went with formal civility. They moved towards the door. I thought they would shake hands, and then something went wrong. Guthrie turned on the boy and was lashing him with words. He had some hold on him, some hold that made it safe to be briefly and hideously cruel. It was over in a few seconds. Lindsay was gone. My dear young lady, you must have no apprehensions, but come downstairs and repeat your story to Inspector Spate. He's speaking with Mr. Gilby, I believe. Inspector, Miss Guthrie is now ready to give her statement. You will find it revealing. Is that so, Mr. Weatherbone? There's a message up from Kincaid I thought you'd like to have. They found Lindsay and the young lady at Liverpool. Hmm. The two are on the road back now with Mr. Appleby of Scotland Yard. Are they married? No, miss, not yet. Appleby, eh? Big shot. Uh, Mr. Gilby, I'll warrant me, if you please. Uh, would you be so good as to show me the gallery? Surely. There's a disconcerting number of dead Guthries on these walls, Mr. Gilby. Hmm? Mr. Gilby, you have some idea of what the police have in mind about this affair? Hanging the elusive Lindsay. Quite so. Now, let's glance at Spate's case. Lindsay kills Guthrie and runs off with his niece. An old feud, a new quarrel. What do you think of that? Uh, it's lurid and it's crazy. Christine wouldn't fall for a chap like that. And, uh, and? Well, we have an embarras de richesse. Do go on. Well, it's too much villainy about Maynard Castle and Guthrie too. Uh, my idea rather is that Guthrie was up to something. Yes, I agree. Now, if Lindsay could be shown to have paused in mid-flight to chop a few fingers off the corpse... A madman's dream. Exactly, a madman's dream. And your first impression of Ronald Guthrie was that he was mad. Yes. Oh, it's a most horrid picture. But this is it. Ronald Guthrie committed suicide and in the same instant committed an abominable crime. He would not let Lindsay have his niece, a fact of pathological intensity. He plotted to prevent the thing by Lindsay's death and his own. Good God! You can see why he chanted Dunbar's poem. There was to be a crime and a witness. Yes, there was to be the best sort of witness, a medical witness. Hardcastle's doctor. He failed to show up. You and Miss Guthrie turned up instead. Guthrie decided that you would serve. And now, the plan. Lindsay was to come on Christmas Eve and take Miss Mathers quietly and secretly away. Lindsay was to be brought up to the tower for a final interview. And at a set moment, he was to be dismissed. And dismissed in a particular mood. Mr. Wedderburn, the man was a thief. You scarcely exaggerate. And you see what actually happened? Summoned at a very precise time by Hardcastle, who was undoubtedly in Guthrie's pay. You came up the tower staircase just in time to meet a very angry young man coming down. Hardcastle made a noticeably ineffective attempt to stop him. Lindsay succeeded in getting downstairs and, together with Miss Mathers, shook the dust of Erkany from his feet, suspecting nothing. No sooner was Lindsay through the study door than Guthrie dashed through the little bedroom and over the battlements to his death. What 
For would it not work? Yes, it very nearly didn't. Guthrie's nerve failed him at the last moment. He was unable to lop himself off a finger or two before he fell. Hardcastle, faithful no doubt to his instructions, spread the rumour nonetheless, further to implicate Lindsay. Mr. Wedderburn, I most frightfully admire your unruffled calm. Guthrie must have been horribly and obscenely mad. No. On all this, there is nothing that is not logical and clear-headed. Strictly, he was sane, wicked and fantastic. There's only fragmentary evidence for real craziness, and they were nearly his downfall. I refer, of course, to your learned rats. Sorry? Well, his timing. It had to be near perfect. You had to be on the stair as Lindsay was coming down to summon you by means of learned rats. A fantasy before he settled on his perfectly rational plan. So that's the story. Sir. Lindsay's in the clear, Constable. Never your leave, sir. It's the coarse creature Hardcastle. He's bolted? No, sir, but he's drinking like a fish. Oh, is that all? But, sir, you don't understand. And I don't know what to do. The Darth Crater's drinking water. The gummerel chill's down by that cattle trough in the back court. He took the poison for his torment. What was the rat nature lured him to it? We did what we could, but it was plain that Hardcastle had gone to his account. I suppose he'd been drinking in verity. He could hardly otherwise have mistaken a rat-poisoned mess of meal for his dinner. It was a drich wait then until the arrival of the motor hearse to take Guthrie's body to Kincaid. Gilby and I then had work enough until it was time to return to the village and the sheriff's inquiry. It will be sufficient to say that I carried all before me. The madman's dream was over, both Guthrie and his accomplice Hardcastle dead, and the scheme exposed. Guthrie did not mean for Christine to write that last letter to her beloved Uncle Ewan. What he meant was that, hard upon Lindsay's descending in a passion, Guthrie's body should be found at the bottom, and Lindsay should, in Aeneas's phrase, swing for it. Where does you um, uh, oh, wonderful show? <laughs> I fear it all must have gone over your head, Mr. Appleby. I say, Sybil, pass the chutney, would you please? I took the opportunity this morning of familiarising myself with the facts. I must congratulate you, Mr. Wedderburn, on your most original interpretation of them. Highly convincing. Oh, my, my dear Mr. Appleby, it was my good fortune to listen patiently to the gossip of the hostess of this inn. Indeed. The fantastic rumour about the mutilating of the corpse. Rumour to be damaging must be true. I noted the fact of Hardcastle's curiosity about the body, and that he spread the rumour that Lindsay had mischieved Guthrie, that he'd chopped the fingers from the corpse, Mr. Appleby, after the old feud. There was no such wound. Why, then, the rumour? Hmm? <laughs> I say this is a piping curry. <laughs> Christine said a queer thing. She said, I can't believe it. My uncle had a finer mind than that. But he was capable of being more ingenious. <laughs> oh, bless my soul. <laughs> and she said uh, he would pit extremes only against extremes. Mr. Appleby, as a police officer, you must have seen many people distressed by dreadful events. How do people's minds behave when they've been through a horrid thing like this? I think, Miss Guthrie, she will brood as long as she feels she hasn't got the truth. <coughs> a glass of water, Mr. Wedderburn. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Appleby, <laughs> will you be so good as to explain the statement you've just made? There are too many pieces. Miss Mathers has herself one piece of information which has not been pulled. Who was with her in the schoolroom? and who emerged from it and slipped into the darkness before Gilby and Hardcastle went up the tower staircase. I say, I'd forgotten about that. And who opened the trapdoor onto the battlements, passed through it, and bolted it on the lower side? Oh, Mr. Appleby, this is the slaughter of the innocents. I think, therefore, there is truth yet to come. Do you agree, Miss Guthrie? If you find real evidence of another person in the tower, I agree there is truth yet to come. Mr. Appleby, come to work, honey. And this is the crater made by the body, I don't doubt. Yeah. That was some impact. 
All those pieces of the puzzle. There's a missing piece we ought to find hereabouts. Uh, could you give me the spade now, Mr. Gilby? Uh, here you are. Thank you. Now for the skull of Yorick. Well, it's a job we'd be better doing in daylight, but uh, needs must. Uh, brought about over there, if you would. Yeah, right here. Gilby, here. Uh-huh. Hold the lantern. Right. There you are. Hey. Oh, it's sharp. Oh, it'll make a nice present for Inspector Spade. Oh, it wasn't Spade's fault it wasn't found. There was no real reason to suspect its existence till this afternoon. Uh, and, of course, it fell from that height deep into the snow. Uh, but it will please Wedderburn. The suitable finger-lopping instrument is the most desirable accessory to his case. <laughs> he laid the Urkany mystery to rest this afternoon, and... I wonder if it would be better not to agitate it anew. In times like this, I must summon the abstract principle of my profession. Which is? Justice, Mr. Gilby. The principle of justice. Come, let's join the others in the tower. Well, Mrs. Hardcastle's rat poison seems to have had the desired effect. Yes, indeed. Most of them were still very much alive when I was up here this morning. Were you indeed, Mr. Appleby? Yes. Mr. Guthrie was evidently a reader. Medicine, medicine. Ah, Flinders, Experimental Radiology. An interesting book, but an interesting flyleaf, Mr. Wedderburn, you noticed? Mm -hmm. Richard Flinders, Fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons, born in South Australia, February 1893. Died it, and it stops there. Oh, uh, I'm afraid I missed it. Uh, could it be connected with Guthrie's colonial days? The ink is fresh. Is it Guthrie's hand? No. Born 1893. Now, can we learn anything from that? Christine told me her uncle came home from Australia after his brother died. He inherited Urkany in 1894. It doesn't fit. Good. Now, do Guthrie's recent purchases happen to include a medical directory? Mm, yes. Yeah. Um, uh, Flinders. Oh, big gun. Big gun indeed. Worked Adelaide, Sydney, a long spell in the States, short periods in London. Publications include Radiology of the Cardiac Region, Analysis of a Case of Long-Term Amnesia, Radiology ah, of the... Mr. Appleby, is this really interesting? Interesting? The distinguished Flinders is not merely a big gun. He's a prodigy. A prodigy? Definitely. Born South Australia in 1893. Now, if we accept that statement, we have to believe he graduated in medicine at the age of seven. Oh, this is nonsense. On the contrary. It is the first glimpse of the truth. And now, we'd better aim at the truth all round. Miss Guthrie, I think these developments take you somewhat out of your depth. They do, indeed. Then listen. I give you the same promise about Lindsay that Mr. Wedderburn gave. He is out of it. So now, let me ask you the question Mr. Gilby asked. However did you know Guthrie had committed suicide? I didn't. In fact... I saw him sent over the parapet. Yes. I think we might usefully go down to the gallery. What for would it not work, man? What for would it not work? Shine your torch here, Miss Guthrie, please. And on this one. And this. Uncanny, isn't it? Two hundred years separate these portraits, but it could be the same face looking down on us. Can you repeat the end of Dunbar's poem? Send for the deed, remed is none. Best is that we for deed dispone. After our deed that live may we to more mortis conturbat me. <laughs> Ranald Guthrie had a pretty art in turning medieval piety or irony. Death threatens, best so to arrange it that one continues to live. That was his reading of Dunbar. And somewhere, Ranald Guthrie is alive now. Oh. It was his brother Ian mysteriously vanished in the Australian bush who became Richard Flinders, the Australian surgeon, uh, significantly the author of A Study of a Case of Long-Term Amnesia, who died. Good. Ranald's story we shall piece together. The full story of Ian we shall never know. Another of my learned rats. And another account settled. Good Lord, look, a notebook... Clamped in the dying creature's jaws was indeed a notebook. A notebook penned in desperation by Dr. Richard Flinders to ensure that the truth may one day be discovered. 
Dr. Flinders, who had throughout his adult life retained the name he was given in 1893 after being pulled barely alive from a bushfire. He became a brilliant doctor, but alone among his numerous studies of radiology was the paper entitled An Analysis of a Case of Long-Term Amnesia. The restoration of his memory occasioned, it would appear, by his hearing the strains of a pipe band, prompted no action. That his brother had abandoned him to die in the bush brought more sympathy than a desire for vengeance. Upon retiring and making his way to a peaceful and secluded old age in California, Ian Guthrie first desired to fill the long blanks in his memory, before ending his days as Richard Frindles. He wrote to his brother Ranald, thereby allowing ample time for Ranald to devise his plan. So, Hardcastle's doctor arrived by night, reckoning without the tortured memory of the poor mad brother who abandoned him, and who, convinced his brother was coming to wreak terrible vengeance, overpowered and held him in the tower, and reduced him to tying desperate messages onto the legs of rats, until the young Lindsay came for his final interview. Lindsay dismissed, Guthrie pitched Flinders to his death. Fratricide. But why? What drove him? What was his motive in such devilry? The shadow of the crime in Australia. The massive feelings of guilt crystallizing on it, resulting in a fearful certainty that Ian was coming for absolute vengeance and must be outwitted and destroyed. But I looked at him. And no, you said... As if an artist had wiped the baser lines away? Yes, and that was why he broke with such fury into this gallery, to see again the family portraits, so as to assure himself of the feasibility of the plan, once he knew that Ian Guthrie, Richard Flinders, was on his way. No, you were looking at a different man. Richard Flinders died as Ranald Guthrie, and Ranald Guthrie will live as Richard Flinders. Oh, my America, my new-found land. Yes. He swatted up enough medicine to carry him through in the event of any unforeseen intrusion on his privacy by medical people. And, and he tried to rid himself of a dead giveaway, his pathological miserliness. <laughs> An impossible task. He may well serve caviar, but neglects to stop starving his dog. <laughs> Mr. Appleby, I can stand this no more. I want action. Where is Ranald Guthrie now? A couple of nights ago, he was in Kincaid. The ghost. He was Dr. Flinders en route for California. And our next move is to listen to Miss Guthrie, who may, at last, tell us the truth of what she saw. Everything I said was true, up to a point. Ranald and Lindsay were in the room. Ranald lashed Lindsay into a passion. Guthrie went out by the bedroom door and Lindsay by the staircase door. And then, I'm afraid, the lying begins, rather by omission, because I heard something... A cry or, or a shout. I thought the two had somehow got out onto the battlements and were quarreling there. The place was fearfully dangerous, and I, I suddenly felt it was all a stupidity I wasn't going to stand for. Castle, Urkany, craziness. I'd had enough. So I groped my way along the parapet to tell them to stop it. I said. I got round the corner, and there was certainly something going on. It was a confused vision, but I saw Ranald Guthrie's face. His arm rose into the lantern light, and I saw he was holding an axe. Then I think he stooped down. I was aware of a confused movement. A moment later, I saw him again, reared up against the parapet. He staggered and, and gave a great cry and went clean over the parapet. That's all. I saw nothing more. What I was sure I had seen was Lindsay kill Ranald Guthrie, perhaps in some sort of defense against that axe under extreme provocation. So you took him under your protective wing? I am not like you, Mr. Appleby, sworn to certain accepted canons of justice. My private morality says a Neil Lindsay oughtn't to be hanged for killing a degenerate nuisance like Ranald Guthrie under outrageous provocation. And why Lindsay? Miss Guthrie, was not Ranald just the sort of hospital case that, say, Lindsay, granted a certain pressure at one critical point in life or other, might have become? I would have done the same. I must admit, I couldn't understand why it didn't just come clean at the inquest, though. Somehow, I couldn't bring myself to shake his hand. Now I know. And now I know we must bring Ranald Guthrie to justice. We'll get him. Ranald Guthrie's played his last trick. Now I wonder who that is. Oh, 
Minister. Uh, come in. Uh, Mr. Weatherford. Mr. Appleby, have you met Mr. Jerby? At the funeral. Uh, Inspector. Minister. You have news? The strangest news, Minister. Ranald Guthrie is alive. Alive? Then I suppose I saw no ghost. You saw the ghost? What else is the minister for? Idle havering old fool that he is, than to hold with such daftness and bogle talk. <laughs> but can we have your strange story first? So it's fratricide. And somewhere Ranald Guthrie is alive now. The ice on the lock is cracking. Ranald Guthrie had long since given himself to the devil. And the devil gave him the devil's own gift in return. Pride. Uh, no doubt. Mr. Appleby, you wonder if in all the complex of motives you have discovered, the master motive is avarice. I think the master motive is pride. Pride made him take a tortuous and diabolical path. He forbade the marriage of Christine and Lindsay. It could not be. But pride forbade him give the reason. Neil and Christine are brother and sister. This is what I am here to tell you. No, minister. Half brother and half sister. Christine is the daughter of Guthrie's own sister, Alison Guthrie. An eccentric and solitary woman. She died in some lonely place at the child's birth. The father was Watt Lindsay, already a married man with a son. It doesn't matter. All he had to do was explain as soon as he knew of their attachment. He could not speak. Shame, fear, pride. Is it, sir? Yes. There are a couple of letters. I must find strength for the duty that is laid upon me tomorrow. But if we left it alone, Ranald gone, no one knows. Ranald would divulge it on his deathbed. It would be his only triumph. Find him, strike a deal, silence for silence. No. Many people must marry unwittingly. No. It's then. It must be tonight. <laughs> oh, oh, to anyone try to cross the ice. The next man will go in. Is he and Bell not here? You expected him? We were to meet him for explanations. Private explanations. We don't know what they are, but... Well, there's a secret on every face in this room. What is it? Sit down, both of you. What is it? The first news is this. Ranald Guthrie is not dead. What? His plot against you, Mr. Lindsay, stands. Only he killed not himself, but his elder brother, a doctor recently returned from Australia. Guthrie, alive! Just a moment. Another visitor in sight... I'm taking the same route. It must be you and Bill. Oh, he mustn't take the ice. Will you call to him? Warn him. Go back. My God, it's not Bill. It's Guthrie. Uncle Russell. He must think the castle's deserted. Oh, we've got him. We've got him. Back, man, back. Oh. Sin. I'll get through. Quickly. But wait, Lindsay. Wait for the rope. No, Lindsay! Oh, we to death before then. I'll go further than a man on the ice. Get her over course as quickly as he can. Godfrey, can you hold on, man? I'm coming. Neil, it's not safe. Come back. Neil, Neil. All the rope there is, and it's not good. Hold on, Godfrey, and you'll be as right as rain. There's nothing for it. I must take out the rope. I'm coming with the rope, Lindsay. I've got him. Let me have the rope from a far away as you can manage. Got it. Get back to the old old chimney when I say. Right show everyone. The rope. Heave away. It's moved. Heave out. Mark, it's steady. Move again if you can. Lindsay. Mr. Appleby? Oh, good. You gave yourself a nasty bang on the head. Mr. Bell, what? Mr. Gilby fetched you out. Lindsay? I'm afraid there's no hoping. He's drowned. Miss, uh, Miss Mavis? Uh, 
the others have taken her back to the house. Well, at least now she need not be told until some proper time. Uh, Ranald Guthrie. Lindsay got him out. Yeah. You reckon without him? But Mr. Bell, where is he? The man you mean is here. He's coming round. Before he does, take a look at his hand. There. The fingers. Amputated long ago. Ah, unchancy stuff, radiation. This is Ian Guthrie. Ronald is dead. Dead? Are you sure? Certain. It was 18 months and harvest time before business again found me in Dunwinnie. I took the opportunity to travel up the glen to the village of Kincaid. Mr. Wedderburn. Mr. Wed, come away yet. <laughs> Mr. Bell, how are you? Oh, but a cobbler grown old at his last. Sit down, sit down. <laughs> oh, it's right pleased to, um, to see you. <laughs> Growing old he may have been, but Mr. Ewan Bell expressed a desire to walk with me up the glen to Erchene to see the castle, perhaps for the last time. First, though, he was good enough to show me two letters the very postmarks of which he assured me had caused a minor commotion in the post office. The first was from Christine Mathers in Ohio, where she was living with Sybil Guthrie, who in the fullness of time had told that poor young lady the whole truth. The other bore a Californian postmark. It was from Dr. Richard Flinders. John Appleby, a gentleman I suspect ill accustomed to being wrong, would have it that the case defeated him, Mr. Bell. He neglected, he says, the single element that changed its whole composition. There was one question he insists he forgot to ask. But he did ask it, that clever London man. I would have asked it again were it not for the speech things happened with. Who was it slipped out of the schoolroom in front of Hardcastle and the lad Gilby when they were on their way to the tower? Forgive me, Mr. Bell, but you are not in the first flower of youth, a journey not without its perils. I don't know how I got up to Erkeny that night. You'll have mind of the strange letter that Daphne brought me from Christine. Yes. Old man and slow that I am, it was Christmas Eve before I saw that at the heart of it, unknown even to Christine herself perhaps, was an appeal. An appeal which set me on the road to Erkeny, dangerous and daft, though it may have been. It wanted just half an hour to midnight when Christine let me in through the schoolroom window. That I chose the window, not the door, shows how strong was my instinct that Guthrie was an enemy. Christine was waiting there with a little case and coat. Surely you're not going tonight, I asked. It's Uncle's way, she said. <laughs> Alas, was too much in love, I suppose, to allow herself more than a troubled suspicion that it must all be wrong, that there was something sinister and crazy at the core of it. I said, I'll just be going up to see them, Christine. And when your Neil comes down, away with you. And write to me someday. Then I kissed her. She said, go by the little stair and you're more likely to avoid Hardcastle. So it was then Gilby and Hardcastle caught a glimpse of me, slipping from the schoolroom. It was up the little tower stair before that fit young man made it halfway up the big one. All I had in mind to do was to come in on the interview and declare myself a friend of Lindsay's who wanted to see him safely away with his bride. I came out through the trap door onto the parapet. I was on the other side from the study window and the American lady, though I never knew she was there at the time. The cry that brought Miss Guthrie away from her window was mine. I don't doubt it was loud enough, for as I was going cautiously along the battlement, my lantern at my feet, something rolled out of the darkness that almost tipped me up and sent me over the edge. I put down my lantern and stooped over it. It 
was a human body. Who's that? Straightened up from the huddled form. Sore afraid. It was Neil Lindsay. Who's that? Guthrie rose up by the parapet, full in the light. I was in mortal danger. His axe was swung back low. A rising stroke that would either cut me or cleave me from the chin up. A ticket in first and a dead... So much, Mr. Wedderburn, for the death of Ronald Guthrie. It sits heavy with me. Bless my soul. Bless my soul. It's a fine carry-on for an elder of the kirk. I knelt down by the figure in the snow and whispered, Man, Lindsay, are you all right? You may take it. I was fair scunnered to find myself looking at a Guthrie. My first dark thought was that I'd killed the wrong man. He was drugged, I think. But had just wits enough to tell me who he was. Ian Guthrie. I told him my own name, and his eyes lit up. So it's now fifty years since we sat under the same dominion. I carried him down the wee stair. You can <laughs> Oh, I carried a cap that was heavier often enough than my father's crop. Through the trap door and away to scare the folk of Kincaid as a ghost. And yet he returned. The dreadful accident with the ice. I asked him to. He wanted to go secretly away. I just got a bit common sense through the dark Guthrie passion. Fifty years as Richard Flinders wouldn't rid him of that rank eccentricity. I thought we had a duty to explain ourselves to Christine and the poor Chiel Lindsay. I engineered a meeting. But I wasn't expecting the policeman to be there with yourselves. Right fortunate it was that he proved to be a wise man, that Mr. Appleby, knowing where to let be. Ronald Guthrie and the coarse creature Hardcastle were both dead. Ian Guthrie, a childless man whose attitude to the estate was his own affair. Silence for a time on the whole story was a mercy to Christine Mather. Ah, there it is. Castle Erkenny. You know, I gather from the Edinburgh papers that it's to let. But I doubt its only tenants hereafter will be the rats. Aye. The Guthries are gone from these lands. The castle is to let. And all their goods dispersed. The portraits were sent out to Christine. I bought the books myself. <laughs> they come in handy when I have conversations with the minister. <laughs> He took the old Flemish table for the session house. Stone will fall from stone. And that high tower I climbed will be forgotten. I that in hill was and gladness am troubled at new with great sickness and feeble at with infirmity. Timor mortis conturbat me. Of pleasance here is all vain glory. This false world is but transitory. The flesh is brockle, the fiend is slee. Timor mortis conturbat me. In Lament for a Macca by Michael Innes, Aljo Wedderburn was played by John Shedden, Ranald Guthrie, David McHale, Christine Mathers, and Lacey. Ewan Bell, Callum Mill, Inspector Appleby and Mr. Roberts, Michael Mackenzie. Noel Gilby, Ernest Blake, Sybil Guthrie, Gerda Stevenson. Hardcastle, Martin Black, Mrs. Hardcastle, Edith MacArthur. Neil Lindsay, Benny Young and Isa Murdoch, Victoria Davidson. Miss Strachan, Mrs. Roberts and the wee boy were played by Gwyneth Guthrie. Clem Clackett, the minister and the constable by Brown Darby and Inspector Spate and Tamas by Robert Patterson. Lament for a Macca was dramatised for radio by Kathleen Jamie and directed in our Glasgow studios by Patrick Rayner.